move it to so, so it will move it to like right about there. That'll be that'll be good. Next time, next time, yeah, next time. Welcome everyone to come uh, today. And first of all, we would like to thank the Cafe Fellow New York to providing the venue and all other supports. Without their support, the events won't be happening. And we're, since we're using their space and all of their volunteer stuff, there's some rules to follow. Um, so I'm a volunteer at Cafe Fellow, and we have a code of conduct that we hope everyone can follow, not just for today, but also in the future if you want to come to more. And it's a lot of Zongwen. Okay, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Me Too movement, but um, we're having this code of conduct actually kind of to follow the whole movement that um, this.
this is a space supposed to be everyone should respect each other and should be free of any harassment. So if you encounter or if you see any um, harassment or anything like or any um, disrespect or any um, racism or any kind of things, you're welcome to talk to either me or Robin or just don't hide it and tell us and we hope this is an environment that everyone is free to share what they think but with respect to each other. So if you see anything, currently, please don't hesitate. Come to me or Robin. Thank you. I am uh, I'm going to talk about a little uh, about this group we're trying to create. Uh, we're called Taiwanese Data Professionals, and the focus of this group is going to present informa informatic lectures, workshops, and networking events for Taiwanese people in Europe interested in data uh, professionals. And we are here to enable everyone to come to find a role model and <coughs> encourage to share their ideas to one another and hope we can help this group to interact at, with the mainstream data science group in New York. Um, today's our kid up event called Conclusion with James Powell and Robin Lee. We're going to have two 20 minutes short talk and a joint 40 minutes Q&A section. Uh, we volunteers are working on making this event as a monthly event, but we really need help. So if you're interested, please contact me after the event. And I highly recommend it. <laughs> I've been in, and I love it. So. Today we're honored to have our two speakers. The first one is Jen Powell, who is a Python. <laughs> Jen Powell is a Python expert, specifically in quantitative finance data science and building community. Uh, he's going to, uh, he's also a main organizer of Pi Data Conference, if you guys heard about it before. And he's going to talk about the community building today. Robin Lee is a senior analyst at New York Times. He's involved in many Taiwanese American organizations. He's also going to talk about his workflow with SQL and how he cleaned up the queries so that it's easier to maintain uh, by using CTES, I have no idea what that is, and few, as well as re reducing the hard code logic. Uh, let's just get started. First one will be Yeah, um, are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, okay. Start, start with the worst one and then go to the better one. Commentate what's fresh in the So this is a talk about building community. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here speaking in front of all of you. Thank you, KT, for allowing me to come present. Uh, this is uh, Cafe Philo with uh, the Taiwanese Data Professionals Group. It's Friday, February 23rd, 2018. And uh, my name is James Powell. I don't think I know any of you, except for KT and Alan and Ronnie. Uh, so it is my pleasure to meet you and to get connected to a brand new community here in the city. Yeah. If you like this talk or you want to see other talks, I don't usually give talks like this. 
time. I actually usually give talks about things like SQL, and I wish they had asked me to talk about SQL because it would have been much easier. But if you, like, if you like talks about that kind of stuff, you can follow me on Twitter. I don't use this code on Twitter. And so I was asked here to talk about community. And this, and I knew I was going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes, but this is probably one of the hardest talks I've had to write in a very long time. Um, typically, I give about 15 or 16 conference talks a year on topics about Python and SQL and things like that. And only so often do I talk about kind of the community behind all of this. And so when I was asked to talk about that, I thought, okay, what can I talk about that is novel and unique? What can I tell you that you haven't already heard that's a unique perspective that isn't just the same trite truisms that everybody says about community, yeah, go, everyone loves community. What can I tell you that's new or fresh or unique? And I tried to think back on my interaction with community and how I invest a considerable amount of my time in various aspects of the data science community and the Python community. Um, I go to a lot of Python conferences. I've helped with the organizing of conferences like PyCon Canada, Pi Caribbean, uh, Pi, Pi Now in Hawaii. Um, I even helped a little bit in getting this group started, just a little bit. Um, I help out with a local community here in New York that's all about Python, called NYC Python. And we meet just down the block at the Microsoft building across the street from the, across the, street from the, time, the New York Times building every Wednesday. And I am probably most closely connected to this community because I serve as vice president uh, of PyEDA at NumFocus. NumFocus is a 501c3 nonprofit that fiscally sponsors basically every tool in data science relating to Python. So the focus is the entity that governs and fiscally sponsors Pandas, Jupyter, uh, the Julia language itself, NumPy, uh, it, SciPy is an affiliated project. Anything that you do with data science is related to the focus. The focus also puts on the PyData conference series. We held one of these in November just recently, but we hold about five to seven of these events worldwide. One consistent problem that we've had is that we've had events in the US, in New York, in San Francisco, in Seattle. We've had events in Europe, in Amsterdam, London, Berlin, and Warsaw. We've had events in India, in Delhi, and this year we might do one in Bangalore and Pune. We've never had an event in East Asia. And I think the, probably the best venue for something like this would be where they held uh, Python APAC a couple years ago at um, so Academia yeah. Sinica, yeah. And so if any of you are interested in helping to create a PyData event in East Asia, namely in Taiwan, please let me know because it's something that we wanted to do for a very long time, but we don't have enough resources on the web. Okay, so the questions I was trying to answer for you, why this was very difficult, is I was trying to think, well, why build a community? Or, or why even bother to volunteer? And it's not really clear to me that I can give you an answer that isn't kind of a false answer. I can tell you, you know, it's for the good of humanity, I can tell you, oh, it's good for your career, but we've all seen these questions before, and we all know people who are successful in their lives, they make a lot of money, they're thought of well, they're nice and kind people, and they don't really go to meetups. They don't help start conferences. They don't talk to conferences. Look, I know data scientists who will say, don't go to a data science conference. Just go to um, you know, NIPS or something like that, and that's all you need in your life. And those people are they're smart, they're good at their job, they know what they're doing, and so there are different perspectives. I can't tell you that this is the key, the only way that you can be successful, because it's not true. The answer to this question is much deeper than that. Question, what is that answer? And, and I really struggled to come up with this. Now, one thing that I thought about was originally, now if you think about it, originally, the reason that many, many of us got involved in this, and the original, the, the original motivation for forming a community in data science was looking toward the future. It was the only choice. 10 years ago, Python was not taken seriously as a language for these purposes, and so the only choice we had in order to work the way we wanted to work was to form communities, to work together, to build it. And that's no longer the case. And to borrow a really bad pun, today, this is the case, right? You don't have to do that. You can focus all of your energy and all, all your effort not looking at building community, not looking at the future, but just looking at what can I do to make you know, some money for myself. And so that, to some degree, fails as a, as a, as a universal answer. We're no longer in this case. We're, we're in a case where these communities are already built. Why start a new data science community in New York when there already are so many? And what I tried to think about was, 
if you think about it, okay, let's say that you're committed to building community. Well, what kind of community do you want? And if you think about that question, it might lead you to another one, which is, what kind of world do you want? And the only answer I can give you, and the only thing that I can say that universally motivates me and the people I know, is really focusing on this question. If you think about it, building a community, helping to volunteer to make this a stronger meetup, is all about collective action. It's all about doing something greater than what you can do with your own resources. And that collective action is directed towards certain goals. For me, these goals are as follows. I see good people who do not succeed because they're unlucky, because they have bad circumstances. And I see that in many cases, the circumstances of the world conspire such that just being a good person isn't enough. And through collective action, through the building of community, we can try to correct some of that. I see that in many cases as helping oneself succeed. That is, the only way that we can correct these orientations to society is by helping people that we know. Uh, let me put it in a much simpler way. I recently have been putting a lot of effort into finding somebody I know a job. Two people, actually. And if you really think about it, I don't get a recruiter fee. I'm not a recruiter, so why bother? Well, here's what I know. If these two people get good jobs, and they make lots of money, and they become managers, and they become very successful, I know for certain that that success is going to lead to them doing the same thing for somebody else. I know that these are the people who, if I think about who do I want in the world to be successful, it's them. And when you think about it, we can all think of at least one or two people who are very successful in this world, and we really rather they not be, because their contribution is their contribution is not socially positive. I think we had a conversation about this. <laughs> we, all, we, all know, we all know at least one name on top of that. For you specifically here at this meetup, I think there's a question of helping your own community succeed. Uh, I, 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 have, I haven't been to Taiwan in five years. The first time I went was a long time ago. I was there because I received the scholarship, the Mandarin Enrichment Scholarship, uh, provided by the Ministry of Education. And when I first got to Taiwan, there were a lot of communities in place for helping foreigners integrate to society. The reason for that is the whole purpose of the scholarship was a soft power thing. It was the Taiwan government trying to build closer relations with the US government, and as a consequence, bringing US students over and having them fall in love with the country so that that would subtly improve relations between the two nations. And so there was a lot of support and a lot of help to integrate foreigners into Taiwan society. That kind of exists here in the US, if you are from outside the US. For professionals, it doesn't really exist. In the sense that, think about all the struggles that many of you had to face when you first came to the US, and what communities there were to help smooth out. And think about your goal for coming to the US, and whether that, at some way, in some, to some degree, ties to improving the conditions of people that you know who are from wherever you came from. Is there some way that through these communities we can help those people succeed? We can build a community that helps. It's okay to build a community that helps maybe Taiwan professionals, Taiwanese professionals, and you'll succeed. Is this, it is the point to reward honesty and kindness. There are, there are the, the, if you think about the code of conduct, the code of conduct is kind of a coercive means for saying don't act this way because if you do, we'll kick you out. But is the community orientated to benefit those who don't need to be told that? Is the community orientated to the people who are upholding the values that we believe in, are the ones who succeed, so that they encourage other people to act in a certain way? Because we know and we see in societies cases where selfish action is rewarded and it encourages more selfishness. Is it the case that service is rewarded? Is it the case that somebody like KT, by, by virtue of putting his time and his effort to organize this, is rewarded for that as an encouragement to other people to do that? Is that the kind of society and community you want to live in? And so in general, the only answer I can give you, the most specific answer I can give you, is that building community is really about a general optimism about society. So it's the idea that through collective action, through these communities, through volunteerism, we can build the kind of world that we want to be in that benefits not just ourselves, but creates an environment that we think is the way things should be. Now, I wanted to make this a little bit, this talk a little bit more specific to this, to this audience, and when I was thinking about, 
I, I know this is going to be really hokey, but there's one thing that I could not shake from my mind when thinking about optimism about society. So I'm very generally optimistic about society. There's one quote I simply could not shake, and I spent all of dinner, or I spent the first half of dinner trying to figure out <laughs> how to start it. But it's from, it's from Benches. No, it, it's, 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 it's something that I could not shake, and I, I could remember, I couldn't remember the whole thing, but I could remember enough of it because I I'd read this like 10 years ago. And, and you've all seen the story. It's a story about the, the, the well. So very simply, when talking about optimism, are people good people or bad people? Do they have benefit? So Mencius, Mencius alleges that if just a regular person today sees a child fall into a well, they'll have this feeling, this um, uh, right? They'll have this feeling in their heart, right? <laughs> that they can't shake. And the question is why? Why do they feel this way? And it's not because they know the parents, right? It's not because they're afraid of what their neighbors will think of them. It's not because of any of that. The reason for this, and the core to it, is a general optimism society. The reason is, this is part of humanity. This inherent desire to build a good society, to be upset when you see injustice, to want to reward kindness and honesty, service and volunteerism, is an integral part of humanity. And that's just about the best answer I can give you for why to build the community and why to volunteer. So I hope, uh, I hope that was compelling for you. But I'm really glad that this, uh, that this group is getting started, and I hope to see it Thank you so much. We'll have the QA after Raleigh talks. You remember your question. <laughs> I'll ask you the actual. So I don't have, I don't have uh, phones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I will have is I'll have the emoji. <laughs> That's like the modern. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I have the emoji of <coughs> brown people of color skin. I look, I tell you that. I quote this and can't shake it from my mind. Yeah, that's very good student. All right. Um, cool. So I my talk is about SQL workflows that are reproducible, auditable, um, accurate, and collaborative. So so even though I have SQL there, but it's really like a I'll say quarter of the talk is really about a mindset when we when we approach the app. Um, oh, my name is Robin Lee. Uh, I work at the New York Times. Uh, this is my handle for Gmail, Twitter, Medium, GitHub. Robin C R Lee. Um, I think that's the right. I don't think that's the right. Cool. So the flow of this talk is really. I'll start off like maybe chatting about with one another about. Uh, some of the common scenarios we have. So just raise a hand if you are a if you ever analyze data in your day-to-day -day work. Who analyze data? Okay, cool. So I hopefully some of those will resonate with you. And um, yeah, there's some. Then if you have question in the middle of the talk, just raise your hand and like ask me to clarify. That's part of the flow. Um, that's not disrupting my flow. Um, and then I'm gonna present a majority of my talk on what Hillary Parker, who knows Hillary Parker? Anyone? All right, who knows uh, Etsy? Stitch Fix? All right, yeah, so she used, she's a really awesome data scientist uh, who used to work at Etsy, she now works at uh, Stitch Fix. Um, and I'll present a paper and do some highlights, um, and then if you're interested, you can read more about her and listen to her talk. Uh, and now I'll, give, I'll inter -me, uh, interview some Examples within SQL. Great. So these are really my intended goals. So um, I'll ask my audience. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. So who resonated with the first statement? Who who analyzed data? Who, I just asked the same question, right? So after the talk, I really think we could. As a community, we can start talking about how do we do better data analysis so that we are more convincing, so that Taiwanese data analysts count, right? We're not just like brush off like, oh, there's some data people, and like, oh, we just need them to make decisions, but we don't really listen to it. No, that's not why we're here. We're here because we have convincing arguments um, about what to do. Um, 
And then depending on your like SQL, how SQL is in part of your uh, work life, uh, hopefully you will take a few tips. Or if you're like already thought about this and you or you have things that you're like, ah, oh, that actually applies to this, feel free to share. Um, we can have you come share at our next talk or uh, just between one another. Um, and then as if we generate data for like, someone else to use downstream, we should also be on the responsibility like, hey, something is up, something's gonna change, so I'll, we'll warn our downstream user, or we can also help our downstream user or our colleagues to move away from not so good practices into some of the best practices. Um, cool, so I'm gonna have the third row of people because you don't you didn't sit in the um, yeah, maybe a second. Oh, what happened, Edward, to start? Can you read the first bullet point? Uh, finish the analysis, assembly deliverable to clients, coworkers, and managers, then someone replies, could you rerun the analysis on another day's range? Who resonates with this? Raise your hand. Okay, someone. All right, can we have the next person? The guy in the, you? Yeah, read a second book. I maintain a few recurring reports. Whenever I update business logic in one report, I will need to make sure I update the other one. Huh, who's seen this or like have encountered this other one? Okay, some of us. All right, cool. Um, let's have you read the last bullet point. Uh, a few of us all work on analysis reports, dashboards that contain a common metric, but they don't seem to match why. Okay, so this is, who who, re who resonates with this? Any accountants here? Uh, no, no one can. Okay, great. Anyway, I think these are some of the common things that, as as uh, people who work in data, we might have encountered in our work life. So the goal is really to to come up with some process to think about how to tackle these. So uh, here's our emoji time. Um, so now this is the one being excited. This is the one being confused and not sure what to expect. I want um, you to pick one, just one. And then, so make your mind like the next one minute, I'll ask for two volunteers. Uh, Ethan and Xilin, can you help be my volunteer? Okay, I'll tell you what to do. Okay, so what they're doing, they're gonna count how many each one votes for what. All right, so raise your hand if you're feeling excited. Raise your hand, raise your hand high. All right, and you, you two would vote as well, so you need to make a decision. I'm pretty excited. So count how many, but don't count it out loud. Keep it in your mind. All right, so let's raise it up for like a little bit more. Everyone make your decisions? Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is if you're excited. This is if you're excited. Let's give for another 20 seconds some arm workout. Make out your mind, okay? All right, maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, so you had a number yet? Ceiling. Ceiling, you need to count too, right? Yeah, you're counting. Kind of all right, okay. all right. Raise your hand if you're confused. All right. Okay, did you get the numbers? Yeah. All right, what did you get, Ethan? For the excited one? 20. 20. All right, what about you? <laughs> Let's do 25. Whoa. All right. Shielding. Okay. What about the one that is confused? What do you get? Ethan? Nine. What about you? Eleven. Whoa. <laughs> when, was the, when, when did we learn counting? Was it in elementary school? Probably, right? So hopefully that kind of makes sense. And we'll do another post analysis uh, just so that. <laughs> We also want to be mindful not to fall into like regression balance doing pre post analysis. But hope that was fun. Um, so you see how easy it is human make an error in our process, in our data analysis, even just counting. Maybe it's copy and paste from Excel into Google Sheet. Maybe it's loading a CSV file. Maybe for me, it's writing SQL. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's writing some cool Python uh, stuff. I don't really know Python. Maybe like spin out some cluster. Um, so we make error, but it's okay, um, because most of us don't intend to, we're not nefarious actors. So Hillary Parker, as I said, 
gave this talk at JupyterCon in our stu studio conference. That's her uh, Twitter handle. She has a podcast that you can listen on the subway uh, commute. Um, and then her really, what really strikes me is this quote. Free up analyst cognitive energy and creativity for the narrative aspect of the analysis that is more subjective and dependent on the audience than the scientific question at hand. So what's actually more interesting is not how many, who counted the right one. Well, that's part of it, that's important. But what's really interesting to us, probably, who are the people who feel excited? Who are the people who feel confused? Who are they? What kind of demographic they are? What kind of background they are? What are some correlation and some causal things that we can learn from it? But because we make mistakes, if we spend our time on fixing mistakes and be frustrated, we don't have time and effort to do Cool stuff. So, um, in her paper, one of the really cool is the mindset sh change. It's instead of blaming an individual on their personal failure, that examine the systems to see how system has failed. Uh, so, can I have volunteers to read this quote? Come on. So, um, Shilling and Ethan, did you think you were trolling us or by counting incorrectly? <laughs> no, right? You probably wanted to count correctly. And most of us had made mistake at work or at our like projects, but we don't mean it. There are data analysis projects, data science projects, data engineering projects. We know there are limitations, but we only discover it maybe two months away. So it is really not our personal failure. It is really um, how we work. Uh, this got cut off by the idea is, however, the opposite is when we feel it is our own fault, then we actually become stuck. We start like, ah, oh, my code sucks. No one should look at it. I'm going to hide it under my closet. That's not good because you won't be a better analyst. We're not here to say, hey, who is a good data professional? Who is a bad data professional? Um, well, depending like your intent. Um, but. Really, we're here so that every analyst, every data professional is better day by day. Our community becomes stronger day by day. So, if that is too theoretical, these are the two states we can be in. We fuck up, we pretend nothing happened, then we screw up again, or like we dead and wrote a post-mortem. Or, we screw up, we look, do some introspection, and then we become empowered as a better data professional. So that's the first thing I think, because it's a lot. Of, it's like all. I'm not going to present all 15 points by Hillary mentioned, because you all have your own workflow. But it's really this concept, uh, the attitude part, that should drive your change. Um, the, now we come to like the content. Like what? Okay, now we get it. But what are the things that we should do? What are the things that we should think about? Uh, let's have Ethan to um, read the first bullet points. They all come around to the, these three uh, things. Let's have you read the first one, and we'll just go around the back. All right. Uh, can you or someone else repeat the analysis? If an external library gets updated, will your results change? If you change your code or your upstream data, <laughs> can you run your analysis with new data or new code changes that then calculate the results? Can your analysts understand you easily? Can you use logic in different parts of analysis to maybe inform in one place? If your data are corrupted, do you know it? If you make a mistake, will someone else know it? Can other analysis uh, make your code more efficient and faster? Can two entities collaborate and combine code simultaneously? Um, I think it's, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, cool. 
Uh, and easily, yeah, easily. So, are there computer scientists here? Yeah, software engineer. Okay. Does it remind you some of the <coughs> principle you do as a software engineer? Your code should be readable. Right, it should be readable. Yeah. Right, perhaps like it's about you need to review someone else. Don't hide your code. Yeah, do some code, code review. review. Right. What else? Any other themes that you have heard that you like? Oh, that actually is similar to this. Okay. So I think there are a few things like if you start googling on, um, and there's like the concept of like modular code. Uh, dependency management, um, executable analysis script. You can uh, definitely read her paper and start the keyword search there. What I'm going to focus on the example is these two pieces because I use it in my day to day work. Um, it's about management, managing my dependency between my code. How do I know I need to do, if I change the code after do some processing, um, I need to know what it would affect. The other part is like, I have logic, I like, for example, well, I'm gonna share it actually. So, I'm gonna use an example in BigQuery using the Hacker News data. Who have read Hacker News? Anyone? So it's like kind of like a Reddit, like PTT, but uh, for like more of a tech stuff. Uh, it's founded by um, Paul Graham, one of the uh, venture capitalists, or more like a startup. So a lot of this thoughts comes from my coworker Gordon Lindnoff, which is a top contributor at Stack Overflow. Um, so the idea is really like don't repeat yourself. When the business logic is updated or will be updated in the future, how do you know? How do you get notified? And like, how do you update your code? <coughs> or are you gonna wait for someone else? Like, hey, if something looks off. Can you check if you are doing things the right way? And can I turn hard coding logic into some sort of table? or a common table expression, or even like views that manage dependency. Um, how's my time? Fine, cool. Um, so Hacker News is like a new site, so it has like story, posts, so it has like Fawen, it has Quaywen, it has upvote, it has downvotes, but all that junk. So what's interesting is there are five types of posts. Story, common, job, and post. What do we notice about the first record? Like, the latest record kind of makes sense. It's all within the last week. But what about the first record? Anything that stuck out to you? It's kind of interesting. It's very old. Hmm? It's very old. It's very old. Yeah, it started in like 2006. So it's been around for like 10, 12 years. What about between different types? Anything that stuck out to you? Yeah, so it was, this is probably like, the first story is like, six, well, UTC, I don't know if they did the timestamp right, but whatever. They maybe waited for like, this is when the, the site is launched, and like about 90 minutes after, um, assuming the log is correct, no, there's no data loss going on, um, then someone commented it. But there's a gap between job and hope from all these, these story types. So maybe as an analyst, you can think like, oh, you can come up with some stories. Like, oh, maybe the feature wasn't there for to post job in, back in 2006. Uh, or maybe just no one checked out that feature. So th that's assume that the feature of job and post wasn't actually implemented later on um, in 2007 or 2000. And let's say that's the world or universe that we're in. So let's look at a few things. If I were an analyst for Paul Graham on Hacker News, I might be analyzing data in 2006 or the first half of 2007 simply by looking at things, whether it's a story, if it's a story, uh, call it a story, if it's a or main post, if not, call it comment. But what if we're in 2007, all right? Or what if we're in 2007, like, now I might be actually categorizing job posts as comment incorrectly. So that's not good, because uh, that just shows, like, you don't really know what's going on, and, like, if you are a good analyst, you should work with your product team and know what's going on in the business side. So you're like, okay, I know there's a launch going on. Let me change my SQL query. Let me change my code to update this. So instead of that, maybe like you want to start like, okay, um, this binary factor maybe could still work. This two, um, this two, uh, maybe you need to like split out again, like into like a uh, job or comment, a search job, because maybe 
that they receive money from the job, and if you don't recognize those usage, guess what? Like you're gonna lose money for your business. That's not good. All right. So let's look at another example. So um, the current president of uh, Y Combinator is Sam Altman. So we can, he's, a, he's a celebrity. He has like a lot of Twitter followers. So maybe we can come up with some hypothesis when we're looking at this data. Maybe he's more pers pers persuasive. People know his name. So whenever he posts it, he gets higher score. And when we look at it, yeah, that's true. First, when he posts a story, um, we can do like, oh, we know that's his uh, username. So we pass in here. We only look at these three types of uh, posts. We know when he is a poster for the story, he gets a uh, much higher score than someone an average people. Uh, we can debate about what's the best way to take the average in this case, but it doesn't matter for, for our narrative. For post, same thing. But what if you're now interested in all the partners? They are an invest, basically an investment firm, so they have multiple partners. Um, so, but partners come and go, so you need to maintain that list, right? But perhaps like we're not interested in job posting anymore. We're only interested in story or comment, or they're actually only interested in comments, etc. Oh, not comment. Comment doesn't have score. So maybe we're only interested in story. So those logic might be changed. If those logic get changed and they are within just one place in the, your code, that's fine. You don't have one place to update. But what if you have a lot of them? You have a lot of them that points to different reports, points to different um, Excel worksheet, or like workflow, blah, blah, blah. But a better a, a alternative would be like, okay, now let's build a reference table with YC partner's name. So when we join, the original uh, data base table with that reference table, whenever we see someone is on that list, we know, hey, that's a partner. Um, maybe they, they're, um, then that's much easier because you only need to maintain a reference table. So think back where your data come from, how can you reduce um, being, uh, being screwed up by some business logic, and you want to change your business. You shouldn't, as an analyst, you shouldn't feel like, ah, oh, man, business is screwing me up. No, business is changing. That means you have to have a job. So I think that's the type of mindset we should also have. Um, so that really comes to my end is, I believe there are skills and uh, things that are worth teaching, but often overlooked. Uh, and because we might be focused on like cool analysis toolkits, cool machine learning stuff, but our day-to-day -day work is really well, at least for me, is this this stuff. Like, I need to make sure, like, I'm a credible analyst. My, I'm not. I'm I'm honest. I'm genuine. I need to show that. So, by using a certain type of tooling that implements these opinions, I'll let you read those opinions. But I really go back to that list of um, different questions that you should think when you're working on data analysis. Whether uh, maybe you're more of a policy person, maybe you're more a finance person, or you're in advertising. It doesn't matter. I think we all share that common um, common need because we don't want to fail. We want a process that support us, that set us up for success. Uh, and then really, so that at the end of the day, we can be free up to do the narrative part, to do the fun part, to do the interesting part, to tell a story. So, back to this. Um, yeah, you, you guys don't need to count this. <laughs> um, I'm gonna count. So who feel more excited? Who feel excited? No? <laughs> Some of them, all right, cool. All right, who feel confused? More question, perhaps. Okay. All right, so yeah, so really we should start talking about how to make our analysis better, and perhaps if you're a SQL practitioner, share your tips. Yeah, that's all for my talk. Much easier to read, right? 
but the query can run a lot slower because the query planner can't see the CTE. It has to do that operation, so it can't fold operations. Uh, <laughs> Here's something else that's really interesting. We only talked about doing queries on an existing database. Right. We didn't talk about adding entries. Right. If you think about it, you already have statement level, you have transaction level isolation in your database, meaning if you had a bunch of insert statements that relied on each other. Like for example, for on Hacker News, you might have to add three records for one post. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, here's the score table, here's the contents table. Right. Right. You do that in a transaction right. to make sure the database mm -hmm. is never in an inconsistent state. So you add them at the same time. Yeah, at the same time. But if you think about it, what if one of the queries needs information from the other query? So for example, you add the first record and you need the ID from that next record to add a relationship. Uh, okay. You can't do that in SQL because the SQL probably doesn't have variables. So you'd have to do one, one operation, then bring it back into your application, then do the next operation, and you break the transaction level isolation, potentially. But CTEs can include insert statements. So you can actually do large bulk inserts that relate to each other by doing each of them in a common table expression and then having them refer to each other. So you can end up with one expression that does five inserts where they refer to each other that is statement level isolated, so you never have inconsistency in your database. I've never seen anybody do that, but it actually works pretty well. So you, but you heard people do that. Or I've, I've, done, I've done it in my own projects. That's interesting. Cool. So that's about CTEs. Yeah. I think like one a really thing, good tool. Yeah, yeah it's a good tool. And I think like part of that, like I think I have the benefit of not worrying about optimizing stuff yeah. in my current work. Well, it's a platform of the public talk. Yeah, so um, I have a question, yeah. Jan. So I'm, I'm actually a biologist, okay. uh, but somehow I still benefit a lot from uh, NumPy, mm -hmm. um, the NumPy library of Python. And I was wondering what's like the future direction of NumPy development, what to be expected? Is there like, something that's very exciting to be expected in the future? So, so it's difficult for me to talk about the future development of any of these projects. A lot of that's going to come from the developers themselves. NumPy is a special case because it's been around since 2006, and it's a foundational tool, but if you look really closely, it was never really finished. Uh, I don't know if you saw recently, last year, through NumFocus, uh, Nathaniel Smith, uh, who's the core NumPy developer, got a $600,000 grant for what they call NumPy 2.0. In the next two years, they're trying to hire people to work on NumPy with the goal of finishing certain aspects like the data types, um, allowing it to work better with technologies like Apache Arrow, um, a, a lot of things that are focused on really large scale industrial use of NumPy. If you're a biologist using NumPy, I'm guessing all of your data fits into the laptop you're using. You might not see that much. but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to say authoritatively, but you can, what you should do is if you go to the NumFocus website, you can sign up for the mailing list, and every time the project developers for any one of the projects want to announce what's coming up, what their plans are, come through the mailing list. That's how I find out about these. Or texting people. So James, like, what does the work look like for you to organize events or conferences? Organizing a conference is like it's so easy to do. If you have a couple, if you have a couple of things, a couple of things, right? It seems really hard. But one of the things that we all saw tonight. Let me start at the let me start at the other end. What makes a conference successful? And we saw this tonight. There are three markers in my mind for what makes a conference or a meetup or anything successful. Number one, uh, you didn't run out of money. So if you need to spend money for something, you didn't run out of money and have to borrow money from your parents or something. Number two, you didn't burn out the organizers. So the people who organized didn't get so exhausted they can never do it again. And number three, you didn't create some huge code of conduct controversy so that nobody ever wants to go to your event again. Because any mistake that you make, like today we didn't have the projector quite right. Your slides were kind of cut off on the end. You can fix the next time you do it. The focus of those three is if you make the event happen, and people enjoy it, any small mistake, the projector's not right, maybe the speakers were late, maybe one of the talks wasn't that great, you fix it the next time around. So what do you need? Generally, for these things, you need a venue, you need speakers, you need attendees, and maybe you need some budget for 
you know, you need projectors, you need some budget for food. Boom. <coughs> if, you, if you don't have the venue, you can't do it. That is a hard requirement. Typically, there's still enough interest in events that if you have a venue, you'll find attendees. If you have a venue and attendees, speakers will come to you. Sometimes you might have to, you, you, it gets kind of thin. I was asked one year to speak five times at a conference because they didn't have enough submissions. At yeah, at one conference, they didn't have enough submissions. So they said, okay, you submitted, can you just give it one more talk? And I ended up speaking six times. I got a, another talk in there because they didn't have enough speakers. But you know, in the end, people enjoyed themselves and it worked out. If you don't have, if you don't, if you can't raise enough money for food, you know, people will more or less, you know, as long as you're not charging them a thousand dollars and not feeding them, people will, will work with that. So really, it comes down to pick a date, pick a venue, that's it. Yeah. So like, if you work in a company or you work at some organization that has the luxury of offering space for us to use, perhaps once a month or like once a year even, uh, let us know. Let Leo know. We would very love your help. If you're like interested in like organized events, we would love your help too. Absolutely. Any more questions? Alan, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Hey, Jay. Do we have um, a lightning talks next week? Next no, Thursday? unfortunately, there's no event next Thursday at our meetup. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, one thing, oh, talking about speakers, this is actually something important. If you can't find speakers, one thing that you can do is, and this is, I think, generally important for holding events. When you hold an event, you oftentimes have in your mind what other events look like. So for example, when I was talking to KT about doing something like this, sure. what is the format? Well, you think about events you've been to, right. and you say, okay, I'll do that format. Right. But there's no rules. You know, if you want to have two speakers, okay, that works. If you want to have three speakers, if you can't find speakers, and you want to make an event where people just self-organize, or they have people from the audience give lightning talks, you can do that. You know, some things will be more successful than others, but for the most part, I find the community you want to build is a community that won't hold you, you know, to task for trying your hardest to do something. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of flexibility. Yeah, I'd like to comment on like your, uh, like why participate in the uh, community. Because I, I, I've been, so I've grown in Taiwan, so, English not my first language, um, but I think like being part of like some sort of like community organization, whether it's nonprofit or like clubs and school, I think it really sets you up to adapting to uh, the states, and I think that's a really major career benefit. If that's the most, that's at your current priority, that's the most important thing. So because because at the company, no one's gonna teach you how to run meeting, how to organize things, and they suck. So don't look at those those examples, like lows, long meetings. But in community, you don't have, you have the luxury to fail and you have other people who are caring enough because they come out to organize so they will share tips. So I think like for some selfish reason, that's another reason I would highly recommend participating in some organizing, whether it's data related, doesn't have to be data related, it could be Taiwanese or some other social cause to care about. So I'll give you another selfish reason. Who here would consider themselves to be kind of a junior employee at your company? How about, how about like a really senior? So most people are kind of mid-level or junior or shy. <laughs> if, you're junior, yeah. if you're junior, who here sometimes struggles because maybe you don't know about the way that the company works or the, or the culture or whatnot, you kind of sometimes struggle to feel like you want to be noticed. You want somebody to notice you for what you're good at. Right? Nobody? Everybody is immediately valued and noticed? Is that <laughs> Think about this. It's so easy. You have some area where you want to be noticed, something that you know very well. You go to KT and say, KT, can I give a talk on this? When you give a talk, you say to your boss, hey, next month I'm giving a talk. Why don't you just come along and support me? Most people can find the time. It's just one afternoon. If you give them enough time, you can make it work. Suddenly, your boss comes here, and he's in a room full of people who are looking to you as though you're an expert at a topic, sees you in a position of authority, recognizes you for what you have, and that problem is solved. KT, I think, is more than willing to help people in that respect. I think that's the idea of this group, to take people who are members of this group and to lift them up so that they can be recognized by people outside of this group. That's, that's part of what it is. And for you, Robin, I know we talked at dinner about maybe doing some kind of things inside New York Times. Right. And the point is, that's something that you can bring to your coworkers and say, look, this is something that I started 
That was my initiative. That gets you recognized, that gets you noticed, that gets people to pay attention to what you can bring. Right. And you know, the audience you have, the skills that you have. So it's very personally beneficial if you think about it. Should I just so I have a question about data science. I'm not a data scientist, but right. um, like my background is in social science research. So one of the criticisms that I heard people say about data science is that it's a lot of correlation, but not necessarily causality. So I'm wondering, as a data scientist, as a data scientist, how would you to address this issue? Is this an issue at all? Like, would we make a wrong inference by just looking only looking at correlation but not causality? That's all. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm social scientist by training, so I'm a statistician too. Um, I think data scientists. Uh, I was at the talk with uh, Matthew Sagani two days or three days ago at, down at NYU. And he has a recent book called Bit by Bit. I would have highly recommend it. It's free online, but if you want to read on print, uh, like me, you should buy it or just borrow it or start print. Uh, um, and I think he, he, he's, well first, like it's not that easy to find correlation. That's, that's one, I, th I think it's, to, yeah, well. I think it's really easy. It's really easy, yeah, but, but yeah. there are obvious correlations, things that yeah, I take that back. Right, I, I think, so data science definitely cares a lot about prediction and predictability. Um, and as they don't, and whereas social scientists usually come up with a narrative, a story, a theory, then they use some data analysis toolkit to prove that point. So to be honest, like you mentioned, like we would, dr data scientists might draw inference if they focus too much on correlation, but they don't, actually don't care about in the paradigm of prediction-oriented data science, like they don't really care about inference. It doesn't matter what the driver is necessarily, as long as we get the prediction right. Um, and I, I, yeah, so that that's the challenge there. But I think like there are opportunities. They are. I'm pretty optimistic about it. It's hard, but yeah, I don't think I fully under answered your question. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my perspective is only. Let's think about what's the difference between a statistician and a data scientist. Yeah. So a statistician is somebody who, maybe they have a master's or, bachelor or bachelor's degree, they maybe study data science in school if they're younger, or they study statistics, they know about building models, testing models, and they make maybe, you know, starting out they might make $90,000 a year. A data scientist is somebody who maybe has a master's or a bachelor's degree, they studied statistics maybe in school, or data science in school, uh, they know about creating models, validating testing models, and they make $95,000 a year. It's a, it, it, honestly, I'm not a data scientist in any, in any fashion. I do American scientific computing, which you can make a lot more money at if you call it data science. <laughs> the term is very imprecise, and the range of what people do is very much political in nature. And so what's the difference between a data engineer and a data scientist? It depends on what company you're applying to and how much money you want to make. Um, what's machine learning? You know, machine learning used to be called AI. Before that, it was called data mining. Don't call yourself a data mining expert. You won't make any money. Call yourself a machine learning expert. Google will hire you and pay you both. So, <laughs> problems in, this, in, the, in the approach and the technique are valid. And so questions about, especially with machine learning, are you, just, are you just correlating things? And do you actually know how the damn model works? Those are very, very valid problems that are covered, I think, quite extensively. But at the same time, like it, you, you work on the business side. Right. Do they care so much why if they can if you can make a result that works in the short term? Not always. Doesn't yeah. have to. Yeah, it depends. It depends. It depends. So sometimes maybe the reason is nobody really cares why. They just care. They're businesses, so they care about building some process that they can reliably make money on now. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. Then there are like inherently like hard because reality is hard. You can't really draw. You, even if you come up with a great like con um, randomized control trial, like there's not like that in real world. Like, no one can really know. One of my first jobs was building reporting tools for a, a prop desk doing uh, fixed income. And you'd hear th these are these in the finance world. You can oftentimes make a stark division between prop desks and flow desks. Flow desks are desks that make their money um, by just buying something and then selling it. Flow traders are more or less the dumbest people you will ever meet. 
they are so incredibly stupid, but what they're good at is they call somebody up on the phone in the morning and buy something for $10, and they sell it in the afternoon by calling another buddy on the phone for a full meal. Prop guys consider themselves more refined, more erudite, because they trade on the money of the firm, so they'll say things like, oh, uh, Google in the next quarter is gonna do badly, so we should you know, cover our bets with some CDS or something like that. All of those explanations are often very kind of hypothetical or, or post, post, you know, post-factual, they kind of cover up for general strategies, and for the most part, a lot of the success is just riding the market. And so the causation part, you turn on CNBC, and people will have an answer for everything. The stock market went up because the president said this today. The stock market went down because the president said that today. The, the, the causation is kind of phony. And so I think people are often happy enough, at least in the finance world, happy enough with correlation that works, and if it doesn't work, they fire you and hire somebody else. I'm sorry, that's the cynical question. Yeah, perfectly described in a nice way my disdain for working as a finance person. So, how do you sum that up? So, for a new grad or like a junior data scientist or analyst, besides the meetup already happening in New York here, it's easy to just go. What other way you can suggest for? the people who want to get involved in the mainstream communities here in New York. So what did you do before your position in New York Times? Yeah, so when I was applying for grad school, I read a lot of blogs, because I, I took a gap year between college and grad school. So I was home, I had a lot of time. So if you have a lot of time, you read and like watch talks. So you know, start to know who people whose opinion matter and whose opinion um, you find interesting. So that, I think that's a start. Like, you should identify what actually resonates with you more. Like maybe it's some, someone in the data engineering world, maybe someone in the social science world, maybe someone in uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. So pick some role models. Um, and then like, go to, those, go to the places where those people speak and ask them and talk to them. And, or just go to events, like ask what people do and like, ask them like, oh, I learned this. It sounds like you're doing this, but I don't really get it. Can you explain more about that? And they start talking about you, and you learn from the other people. Um, I think that's a really good approach I did throughout my uh, graduate school as well. So, so I have I have something I I, I have a criticism, and I, I want you to help me express this. But you asked at the beginning when you were looking at the data set, how many people here knew about Hacker News? Right. Was the response very good? Yeah, but I don't know if that's part of sh being shy. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's important because yeah. one possibility that I see, because you explained what Hacker News was in terms of things like uh, PTT or BBS. Right. Unfortunately, it's my view that not necessarily Hacker News, but sites like Hacker News are where all of the energy and new research and new approaches mm -hmm. are coming out. Unfortunately, not really PTT or BBS or things like that. They get it after it shows up on Hacker yeah. News. And it is often the case that if you're not, if you're not comfortable working, looking through those resources, either it's a cultural barrier, a language barrier, you're not familiar with them, you're handicapping yourself in a significant way. It shouldn't be the case that, and this is this is also why, when I was in Taiwan, one of the things that we noticed in students was that, at least in the software industry, everything was delayed by about ten years. So, so like new new approaches that you have in the two, in two thousand and three mm -hmm. would be you know state ten of the art. yeah would be would be state of the art there. Wow. Why? Well, it shouldn't be the case these days because everybody has the same resource. Everybody can read Hacker News. Everybody can read uh, Lobster, whatever the website. Everybody can read um, Katie Nuggets. So all that information is there. <coughs> the question is, are you making are you connecting yourself to that information? Are you using that as your resource? Are you contributing to it? And you're going to get stuck recycling ideas that only get to you, you know, so many years too late if you're not. The problem with that is, it shouldn't be the case that if you're from somewhere outside of the Bay Area, your only resource is to look at the Bay Area and do what they're doing, because there are sources for innovation in New York, <coughs> outside of the U.S. But it is the case that in many fields they are the leaders now, and to catch up you at least have to know what they're. My criticism is, if it's the truth that the audience here doesn't even know what Hacker News is, there are there's some big blind spots that you have. 
Um, I, I guess going along with your, your view on hacking is, I'm wondering about your opinion on person development. Should you focus more on the knowledge domain or the technical domain? Because I think you mean like like this, domain knowledge or yeah, I mean exactly because I think in, in this audience, many of us get tagged in as a technical resource and not a a knowledge domain resource mm -hmm. because we learn too much about doing the technical part but not enough about where the data comes from, how it got there, you know, what what can, what the workflow, you know, what the actual life cycle is of data. And if you don't understand the life cycle of the knowledge domain, where that came from, then I think it's, you're always gonna be relegated to be, you know, the, 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 give you the support for this day rather than actually helping the, helping the consumer of the, of the data collaborate on asking new questions. I honestly, you know, people, people, people try to make that distinction. I can't speak more generally than myself. I've always been more technical. Like when I was when I was working at the big banks, I always knew more about technology than I knew about the finance. And I still managed to, with enough knowledge about the finance, I still managed to kind of get along. My first job, I ended up learning a lot about fixed income. Um, but then I, you know, along the way, I started. I worked in mortgages. I still didn't know anything about mortgages. <coughs> It was a bigger group and I didn't have to, and I still managed okay. But on the flip side, the technical part can always be replaced. There, but, but so here's the thing, here's the core. I once interviewed somebody, and they were really, really good at math, and I asked them, okay, how, how good are you at Python from one to 10? So I can figure out what kind of questions to ask you. And they said, I'm a 10 out of 10. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So let's ask you a 10 out of 10 question. No clue. Okay, let's ask you an eight out of 10 question. No clue. Let's ask you a five out of 10 question. That included a mathematical part. Didn't know the Python, but the math was amazing. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, you said you were 10 out of 10. Well, there's a disconnect. And the answer was, oh, the Python, I can just pick that up. It's the math that's important. It turns out, every time I've interviewed somebody, the thing you know the best coincidentally happens to be the most important thing in the world. And the thing you don't know that well, I can pick it up in a book. So I kind of see where you're coming from. But it's my experience that people who are really good technically will say, the domain expertise, I'll look it up in a book. The people who are really, the data scientists who are really good at the analysis will say, I'll just go to Stack Overflow to do technology. <laughs> and the truth is, they're both very valuable. What's valuable is being really good at one of those two sides. <clears throat> what I think, another, another criticism I might have is, a, a, a recent conversation I had was about the immigrant experience. I, I wasn't born in this country, but I basically grew up here. Um, and the immigrant experience for the generation before me, for my, my mother's generation, was very, very difficult. And so she had no choice but to be pretty much the best at what she could do. She's a physician. She had no choice to be an excellent doctor because if she was a so-so doctor, nobody would have given her the time of day. For me, you know, I can kind of goof off a little bit. I think the immigrant situation for for all of you here is a lot easier than it was 10 or 20 years ago, and you're not pushed to excellence. I think the, the real question is not domain versus technology, it's are you pushing yourself to be the best at that area, or are you finding that you know, it's kind of easy to, to go you know, be a, a, a sysadmin or a DevOps person and just kind of sit there. And this is why you can see for Robin, who seems to be very successful in what he does, part of what in, in his conversation, he's always looking at what other people are doing, how he can incorporate that into his work, how he can share his knowledge, how he can add to that. He's always trying to push himself for more and more. And more. Yeah, on the, I think on the topic of domain knowledge versus technical, like I chose to study statistics because I knew, like, if I so my undergrad was in global studies, so it's like political science. Like I knew, like, if I were to use that as my main skill set, I won't stand out. But if I can combine with like math and statistical. Uh, aptitude, then I can stand out, and also I can relate to the social science stuff. Um, so, yeah, like you, if you are, like you have like immigrant background, then yeah, like be good at techno, but that's not where you stop because I think like we fall into this imposter syndrome. It's like you see the image of what the modern data scientists, and it's like they need to be good at math, they know how to prove theorem, they know how to set up cluster. <laughs> And like send alerts to Slack message or maybe like send alerts through Arduino. I don't know. 
that, that's not that's not possible. You just pick a few that are like, all right, I'm gonna be better at this this year, this quarter, this month, um, and then domain knowledge. I think you need to know what you care about, like what fascinates you. For me, it's healthcare. For me, it's healthcare and uh, newspaper. Um, so I don't wanna when I apply for these jobs, I only look at like poli policy stuff or healthcare stuff or uh, media. I started at the healthcare at a physical therapy company doing helping with their e uh, electronic health record and doing some accounting work stuff. Um, and then like so you need you should pick some. And then I think the third piece is especially for like entry level young career like like which I can relate to is really about your network at your work. Can you find a job that like helps where there's an environment where you have role models to look up to where people can you can learn from. And your technical and domain expertise will grow. And just that. I have this question for Jim. So uh, how do you compare the open source communities in recent year, I mean in recent five or ten years compared to uh, well, before, before like Python become the majority of the you know, tools. So I'm asking this because, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I learned Python after I come to the U.S. for this recent two years. And before that, well, I started my first like uh, astronomy projects in my maybe like, five years before. And when I started to use that, and well, I got a laptop, and first I follow the installments. <clears throat> First, I follow the instruments and the website, then try to compile some code on my laptops, and, <clears throat> and find it's extremely difficult to find a depends de uh, right version and right dependency to just compile the the right code, and it spent me like like a month to <laughs> really get it work. And I still don't understand how it works, but it doesn't matter. It finally worked. But <laughs> but after that, I've so I always feel like a software engineer is not my thing, so I would never feel I'm good at this. But after I, um, I start to work with Python, and I feel like, well, everything gets easy, much more easier. And I know there are some trade-off of efficiency or trade-off of like, uh, <coughs> some, others, some other things, but it still makes everything much more easier, despite that I know there's a very old community open source uh, Scientific, scientific library like GNU or like those kind of library. So, uh, so I, I think let me let me cut you off there because I, yeah. I have a question for you too, and I want to, you and I have a chance to answer my question. Oh, yeah. The first thing I think is you see a couple of forces at play. One of them is that open source generally is more normalized and more mature. Mm -hmm. So today, if you say I'm really interested in open source software in an interview, people might say, "Oh, that's good." Twenty years ago, they'd say, "Well, I don't even know what that means." It didn't have the same. At the same time, it, you also see another force, which is certain open source communities are much more mature in the tools that they have, and they focus more on almost providing a professional software quality experience to their users. This isn't true universally. I read an article earlier today about the, about the new compositor Wayland, which is a huge part of the Linux ecosystem that has almost no documentation. That's an older community and they just don't have that perspective. But you're absolutely right. You know, 20 years ago projects didn't have every project that's three months old, has a logo, has full documentation, has a community. That was not the case 15 years ago. Not that I'm that old, but I do I do kind of remember when I was yeah, I do kind of remember a little bit back then, and it wasn't the case. Here's my here's my question for you. I went I had I had an opportunity last year just to attend and speak at PyData Delhi. And it was hosted by a bunch of students, not from like the, it, it's not like the Kaida of like India, it's more like the, like the Datsun Gaozong of India. Like the really like, you know, not like a really great, but maybe okay school of India. Every single one of them wanted to get involved in open source, they wanted to contribute, they wanted to do something, and asked why. And part of the reason was, when we look around, there are millions of students around us, many of them don't really care. We need to stand out, we need to succeed, and they were pushed through. I don't know if that same attitude exists in Taiwan. Taiwan students in university or the ones who come here for graduate school, are they as motivated to contribute, to use, to learn about? I don't know. Because clearly, 
other places in the world, there is that, there is that attitude. So, so what is the attitude? Yeah, and I think like this is really a space for us to like find like people. Hey, maybe we want to work on this, but it's hard. But at least we can find someone to ask questions. Like maybe we want to read Hacker News like once mm -hmm. one article a week, and but you're like, mm -hmm. I don't really understand the context. But maybe two of you find like, oh, these this is interesting. That's we can go to exchange. Um, that's also why we want to create this community because it is for us to become the best version of ourselves in whatever professional endeavor we have. Not to my answer. Do you go to you go to university in Taiwan? Yeah, I go to the university. Do you go to Taiwan? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's the be What's the best uh, department in Taiwan? I think it's EE. -E, w. -E. Medical. No? Medical. Medical school. Physics. Or so it used to people just say Fadu, but it's not. When should it? <laughs> it's the best department in all of Taiwan. Uh, you mean among the, all over the world, right? Among all of the departments there. The most elite? Like what is that? Why is that? No. Because I was told that when I was oh. in school. <laughs> 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 we get, we get, because we all, like, all, yeah, listen, all of them, I think the, the, the amount of knowledge and the contribution was considered to be, like they had to have the most, that's the theory. Okay, so, so when you were in school, did you use open source software? Uh, not actually, because I didn't. Well, in my second year, I take the computer programming class and I failed that. <laughs> I oh. got like forty out of hundred, uh, out of hundred points. Did you do just hardware, or did you use software and hardware? Uh, software. Okay. Did you Did you know about Linux? Did you know about Python? Did you know about no, no, I know nothing. I did only know C. I only know well this compare screen scare me out. You know, I want to keep away from it. Did your friends and your classmates, did they know about those things? Or were they still looking at the no. technologies that existed 15 years ago? I think, uh, well, so for, my, for me, my undergraduate is uh, <coughs> chemical engineering. So, so <coughs> our extreme, the way like we deal with the data is mostly on Excel. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's the problem? Why, why are they not, why are the other students not as engaged as the students that I saw in India who were just, they knew everything that was going on, they were up to date with everything, they saw somebody, they, 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 there were a lot of um, Indian core contributors to Simpai, the symbolic mathematics library. The moment they learned that, they went to talk to those people and said, okay, how can I get involved too? Where is that disconnect? What, what, because I don't think, I think this is a fantastic attitude, and I think that each one of these kids, despite not going to such a great school, are going to succeed and are going to achieve a lot because they're so energetic. What's the disconnect? Because you did go to a school that should have had the most ambitious and the most skilled students. Maybe just because in my domain, uh, in my department, we don't need uh, uh, not much you know, patience on developing some software or something. Yeah. I don't know, I don't really know about the other department. Like, you know, did you have an answer? Sorry. Then maybe just suggest that perhaps the hardware uh, industry. Could be the hardware industry. So it's, it's Majorly, people look at WEs, the leading towards, you know, gearing towards the preparation for hardware industry. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of them is basically going down to how do you create a <coughs> hardware, mm -hmm. a different type of logistic in the hardware. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's still, it's still all script related, but it's a different kind of script. So I guess that's that's the that's a lot of reason. Um, and I also thought maybe. Maybe the dot com bubble, those kind of uh, you know, <coughs> early success in hardware, and as well as the encounter of the dot com bubble in the, in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, um, it's sort of, mm -hmm. you know, just delayed. So mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't help people to get into the, you know, the software industry. Yeah. Yeah. One, of the, one of my last comment is that it reminds, it reflect me of uh, a saw that I. I keep it in my <coughs> I keep it in my estate. At least I feel like maybe uh, for me I start what a thought a thought just just a, a thought. thought just a, a thought, thought. Just, a thought. Right. just a thought yeah just <laughs> I mean I study I, uh, I come to the US study physics uh, but I find it most of time most of my time are spending on learning how to use the tool or how to mm -hmm. develop my own tools mm -hmm. in, <coughs> instead of learning well. Real physics, like I expect back to like 50 years before, you know, write down the equations on the blackboard or something like that. Because 
Well, why do you have that perception of that's the way to do physics? Uh, because that's the way I think <laughs> of physics is. Well, you all form famous about the six pictures, like yeah. how your family think of what you're doing, uh, how you're doing, what yeah, you're yeah, actually yeah. doing. Yeah. Well, just the uh, visions in my mind. Okay. And I feel like uh, if I need to continue my studies in physics, then maybe I should start with getting a degree in computer science, then maybe that okay. will make everything easier in the rest <laughs> okay. of my career. And that's what I saw in like not in astronomy or in <coughs> in physics study. And most of the uh, most of the group they are so engaged to develop the new tools and develop the like new software to analyze data and blah blah blah. blah. And but I feel like well we really spend very minimum time on the physics itself and mm -hmm. we struggle in the hardware and software and everything. Mm -hmm. You see that in the open source community as well. Many of you use Jupyter Notebook. Um, the two core devs between, for Jupyter Notebook, Brian Granger and Fernando Perez. They're both physicists. Uh, Fernando at, uh, originally <coughs> in the physics department at Berkeley and Brian Granger at Cal Poly uh, and Center of if you look at the classes that they teach, they don't really teach physics classes. When they do teach, they teach software classes. If you talk to Brian, he'll even tell you that some of the grant money they brought in for the Jupiter project was to buy him out of the obligations to be a physicist. Those guys are much more software people than physicists. In astronomy, look at Jake Vanderplas. Everything anybody knows about him is about not astronomy, it's about software. And so clearly, you know, there is space for people who know a lot about software and also are strong in the, in the domain, but the software side itself can grow to encompass your entire life. But, but my point for the earlier question was more like, here we have a room full of people who are giving up. Who has something better to do tonight? It's Friday night in New York City. <laughs> who has something better to do than listen to Robin and me talk? No way. Good. Oh, how dare you? <laughs> no, you don't. So why are you here? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? And how can this group do that for you? And my supposition is that maybe one of the things that is missing is just being broadly connected to what else is happening in the world, what's happening here in the data science community in New York, what's happening in the global data science community, and how that connection by itself in a very selfish way can help you stand out, can help you keep keep up, can help you grow and learn. And also, in a less selfish way, consider this. How many of you plan to stay in New York for the rest of your life? Just Alan? <laughs> okay. At I'm some point, yeah. At some point, how many of you plan to go back to Ohio? Some of you are on visa, so you may not even have the, uh, the choice. Um, I mean, if you're on OPT, you have to get a green card, you don't have a choice. Um, one thing that you can do when you go back is you can, you can take what you've learned here, what you have here, and bring that back. And it might not be as challenging or as difficult to really fundamentally change the situation back in Taiwan as you think. Because this gap does exist. If you were to go back to Taiwan and go work at you know, TTV or some other newspaper there. Uh, Think about the skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say, let's say, let's say that was in your plans. The skills, the knowledge that you could bring back. Yeah. The, the, the network that you could build. The, the pipeline of connections that you could build so you could take people who you think are very talented and right. send them to New York yeah. and then have them bring that back. The, what you could do with that knowledge that you've gained in groups like this here in the US, quite powerful. It could really transform, maybe not, Institutions like TTV, but maybe you could start right, your maybe own. Maybe like the new yeah. media, right? Yeah. Start, start your own organization, start your own. So that's about today. We don't have any more time. So let's give our two speakers another round of applause. We will have to leave before 9 30, so before that, you can either help us to rearrange the chair and tables or get talk to anyone here. Yeah, and then uh, to, to, to make the event better while it makes it do some like 
post event survey or like some focus group. So like if your email is not on the event bright, um, try to just send us a message if you want to come to more because so that we can tailor it. Uh, tailor the event for you. By, by the way, by the way, you don't have to help out here, but please don't go straight home. Please use this as an opportunity to meet somebody you don't know, to learn something new. We have 30 minutes. Please don't just go home. Right. There's so much.